Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Okay, so today in the press briefing, we are saying goodbye to two our, of our amazing interns. I think they're here somewhere. Ah, there they go. Uh, Kate Howell and Molly uh, Feldman. They have been great, great additions to additions to our team uh, these past several months, and they are now going back to school. Hopefully, enjoying the holiday before you go back to school. But thank you so much for your hard work. And today we have a familiar face with us uh, to talk about how the president's winter preparedness plan uh, on uh, COVID-19 increases as COVID-19 increases as the holiday uh, as we head into the holidays. And so Dr. Jha is here to talk about this plan and take some questions as well. Dr. Jha. Thank you, KJP. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good to be with all of you again. As expected, we're seeing COVID rising across the country this winter. And while COVID isn't the disruptive force it once was, we are focused on ensuring that the U.S. is prepared for this winter, no matter what the virus throws at us. As you know, we have the tools, we have the infrastructure, and we have the know-how to manage this moment. And that means protecting people, preventing hospitalizations and deaths. And the key is this. We don't want this winter to look like last winter or the winter before. And our winter COVID-19 preparedness plan helps us do just that. So how do we do that? First, and you're not going to be surprised to hear me say this, the most important thing Americans can do is to go get their updated COVID-19 vaccine right away. Now, you heard this from Dr. Fauci just before Thanksgiving. You heard this from me. And I will repeat again, the updated COVID-19 vaccine is your best protection against the version of COVID we're fighting right now. Second, a critical component of our winter plan is making it even easier for Americans to access the tools that will protect them this holiday season. Vaccines, tests, and treatments. So let's talk about tests. Today, we're opening up covidtest.gov for a limited time this winter to give Americans another easy option to access testing when there is a greater need as there is right now. Starting today, each U.S. household can order up to four at-home tests free from covidtest.gov with tests starting to ship as early as next week, the week of December 19th. And as we've said for months, we're operating in a resource-constrained environment in the absence of additional congressional funding for the nation's COVID response. And that means we've had to make some tough choices. Like in the summer, we were forced to suspend the covidtest.gov program so we could preserve our tests. Why did we want to preserve our tests? Because we knew there would be a moment later in the year when COVID cases would rise again. So we kept, we preserved the tests so we could have them on hand for exactly this moment. And if we don't get more funding, we won't be able to send more tests out to the American people. Uh, next, we're standing ready to support states and communities with medical <coughs> personnel, supplies, and other resources, as the president has been committed to doing since the first day he took office. Today, Secretary Becerra is uh, sending out a letter to all governors underscoring that our partnership with state and local leaders has been essential to fighting this virus. But the Secretary also made clear we need them to step up right now to get ahead of this increase in COVID that we are seeing across the country. And he outlined all of the federal supports available to set up more vaccination sites, more pop-up clinics to get more shots in arms, to expand tests to treatment programs, including uh, new tests to treat programs that, uh, sites that, are, uh, that the federal government can help with, to make key supplies like at-home tests widely available, and things that the federal government can do to support hospitals and health systems as needs arise. Because the bottom line is this. We're all in this together. Fourth, we are accelerating our efforts to protect the highest risk Americans, building on the considerable steps we have taken. Now, I want to remind everybody that more than 90% of COVID deaths in the US have occurred in people 50 years of age or older. And in recent months, we've seen COVID deaths really concentrated among those 65 and above. And while we've seen many older Americans step up and get the updated COVID vaccine, there's still too many older Americans who have not gotten their immunity updated, who have not gotten themselves protected. Under half of nursing home residents have gotten their updated COVID vaccine. 
So we are working very closely with leadership of nursing homes across America, and we have asked them to step up to do more. We've developed a winter playbook for nursing homes and long-term care facilities to help them take action, to make it easier to get vaccines on site in nursing homes, to make sure that treatments are available on site in nursing homes, to improve indoor air quality, another strategy that can make a really big difference. And we are reaching out to governors where nursing home vaccination rates are low to offer personalized support. Now, before taking your questions, let me close with this. We don't want this winter to look like last winter or the winter before, and it doesn't have to. What's different is that we have an updated vaccine that targets a version of the virus we're fighting. But we need people to get that vaccine. It's free and widely available. We, what's different this winter compared to last winter is we have highly effective treatments that are widely available if people get sick. But obviously, we need doctors to prescribe them. We need people to get them. This winter, we can keep people safe. We can prevent hospitalizations and deaths. We can minimize disruptions. The administration has been, has been planning for this moment. We are doing our part. We're prepared. But the bottom line is we need other leaders to step up as well, governors, mayors, people who have been terrific partners throughout this entire pandemic. But here's what I know. If every American does their part, if every American goes out and gets an updated vaccine, if every American gets treated who's eligible for treatment, we can have a very different winter ahead. And that is the goal of this effort. So with that, let me stop, take uh, questions, and KJP, I'll turn it back to you. Um, thank you. Uh, Dr. Shaw, moving out from the U.S. borders for just a second, certainly one of the risks that faces this nation is additional spread from a big outbreak in China. Can you give us a sense of whether the U.S. government was aware or made aware in advance that Paxlovid would be, ma would be made available in China? And can you give us any sense of what talks are happening behind the scenes, behind the scenes rather, to help get Western vaccines and medicines to that country? Yeah. So on the specific question of Paxlovid, the U.S. government was not involved in any way. Uh, and it was so really refer you to Pfizer. Um, and but we were not involved in, in that in any way, shape or form. On the broader question you're raising, Jeff, the, what I would say is this. And it, since the beginning of this uh, administration, the president has been very clear that we think it's really important uh, for the world to benefit from the fruits of, the, of, of American scientific innovation. Um, we have been the largest donor of vaccines in the world, almost 700 million doses, many bilateral, many through COVAX. And the president's been very clear. Uh, we stand ready to help any country that needs help uh, in terms of vaccines, treatments, anything else. So uh, that, uh, that offer stands globally for any country uh, that could benefit from it. Would it be fair to characterize this as the U.S. and other Western countries are encouraging China to import mRNA vaccines, but not necessarily with U.S. or strong U.S. involvement? Does that give them cover that they need? <clears throat> no, but what I would say is we stand ready to help any country in the world with vaccines, treatments, anything else that we can be helpful with. We have been the biggest donor of vaccines, as I said, almost 700 million doses. Uh, and that, that stance of being uh, helpful, being ready to help, uh, continues and hasn't changed. Thanks. Dr. John, uh, looking at the most recent COVID numbers we have, it looks like COVID cases were up uh, 45 or 50% week over week uh, last week, but COVID deaths were up 60%. Why are COVID why are COVID deaths spiking more dramatically than COVID cases are? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so some of that is, by the way, data irregularity, just to be clear. The data is just, in, we're in a different place with data. We get data less often. Um, so in general, we have seen COVID cases go up. We've seen hospitalizations go up. Um, deaths are just starting to rise. Um, I do think that that standard link we've seen between cases and deaths are going to be different because there's less testing. So we're going to be, it's going to be later to see cases go up. Um, but so far, nationally, in our analysis of the data, uh, death numbers are just beginning to rise. We obviously want to make sure that does not go any further. We know we can prevent nearly every death from COVID if people get their updated vaccines and people get treated. So um, we continue to, to press that message. And are you considering a return to other restrictions, you know, masking on planes, vaccine requirements? Yeah, so I think we're in a very different place with this virus and where we were two years ago, where we were last year, what I would say is we now have the tools that we can manage our lives much more safely than we could a couple of years ago. 
And the most important thing I think people need to be doing is, first of all, they've got to get their updated vaccines. And then there's a whole host of tools that people can use to keep themselves, their families safe, uh, testing, masking, uh, improving indoor air quality, being in better ventilated places, um, oh, and treatments, of course. So we think that is the strategy of the administration, that we want to encourage people to use those tools. Uh, and given how widespread and how available those tools are, um, I think if people did that, we could get through this winter safely. Um, Dr. Jai, just to follow up on Jeff's question, uh, with China relaxing its zero COVID policies, um, what specific contingency plans do the administration have um, to deal with a potential outbreak or new variants, particularly with the increase of travel between the U.S. and China during the holidays and in the Lunar New Year? Um, and do those considerations uh, at this point include any talks of a travel ban? Yeah. So. Um we have a very robust surveillance program that where we use for travelers as people come in, uh, in terms of identifying people who are infected, tracking variants. Uh, that continues. Um, and we generally are using wastewater, using other mechanisms, constantly monitoring for variants, both here as well as with our partners around the world, in Europe, in, in uh, South Africa, in other places. I think all of that is a really important part of how we have become far more effective at, at being prepared for new variants. And if there are new variants that emerge, I'm confident that we will be able to identify them. Thank you. Dr. Jha, are we still facing a triple-demic where RSV, flu, and COVID are all surging at once over the holidays? Yeah, so we, we have seen, certainly in the last month, three highly contagious respiratory viruses. Um, as you mentioned, RSV, flu, and, and COVID. Let me tell you what we know about them. RSV nationally looks like it has clearly peaked and is on its way down. Um, there's still places that have very high levels of RSV. You're still, but but nationally, there's no question in my mind. RSV is heading down. You know, flu is rising in many parts of the country. We're probably the worst flu uh, outbreak we've seen in a decade. Um, there uh, and there are some places where may, flu may be peaking, but it's very early data. Um, but a lot of flu out there. Again, the worst in, the, in a decade. And then we talked about COVID where clearly it's on, a, on an uh, upswing with increasing number of cases. One other question. Back in September, the president publicly said that the pandemic is over. How has that complicated the messaging to keep Americans vigilant facing COVID? Yes, yeah, so I think the president was also very clear that COVID is not over. COVID continues to pose a challenge for us. Um, that is true. The COVID is not over. And, and obviously, we continue to see people getting infected, getting sick. Uh, unfortunately, too many Americans needlessly dying of COVID. Uh, and so I think the president has been very clear on this even since uh, that day about the importance of get people getting vaccinated, people getting treated. And obviously, I've been out here making that same message. Two more. Go ahead, John. Dr. John, thank you. Um, two, two questions for you. One, is there, are there particular hot spots right now you're concerned about when it comes to COVID rise? And then secondly, based on all three of the viruses you've been discussing, could you talk to us about the strain on the nation's hospitals? Yeah. Um, so particular hospitals, we're seeing cases increase in about 90% of the country. So it is real sort of rising in lots of places across the country. Um, so there's not one that I'm, I think is, in, you know, is particularly uh, worse off. Um, obviously, the, very, you know, the levels are different across the country. But it is rising pretty much uniformly. And it makes sense, right? We just had the Thanksgiving holidays. It's getting colder. Even in the southern parts of the country, it's still getting colder. Obviously, we tend to see more in the northern half of the country because it is colder up here. People are spending more time indoors. In terms of hospital strain, this is something we monitor very, very closely. Um, we look at a whole bunch of national data every day. We are talking to states and jurisdictions every day. Well, not every state and every jurisdiction every day, but on an ongoing basis. Uh, I would say in the last 10 days, I have probably spoken to, uh, I or members of my team, a dozen or more states and cities. And, and our first question is, how are the hospitals doing? Do you need more help there? We have a very clear plan. Uh, if a city or a state gets into trouble where they really just can't manage uh, that they can reach out to the federal government. We have a whole set of resources. If that we can value it, we can send in equipment. We can send in personnel. So we stand ready to help cities and states if and or when they need it. Um, obviously, the single most important thing we can do to make sure that there aren't constraints uh, uh, and there aren't real problems with hospital uh, capacity is if people got vaccinated, they are far less likely to get hospitalized for both flu and COVID. And that's the biggest thing Americans can do to make sure their hospitals are functional for all the other reasons we need hospitals. Okay. Karen, last question. Um, are you concerned that Americans who are testing positive but doing so on at-home rapid tests 
aren't reporting that to government agencies, so the case counts right now might be dramatically lower than what we're actually seeing for spread across the country. Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, what I would say is, first of all, I'm a huge fan of home tests. I think you know, they're convenient, they're cheap, it's great. One of the problems of, of home tests, really the major problem, is that they don't often get reported. So we do have, through this NIH effort called makemytestcount.gov, I think, um, that people can report their tests. But we have other mechanisms we use to monitor infection levels. So for instance, wastewater gives us very good insights into how much infection there is in a community. So we have seen case numbers often uh, be lower than what you might expect if people were doing more PCR tests or more public health tests. But we're tracking infections through other mechanisms. And obviously, we're tracking infections and, and hospitalizations so that that gives us a very good sense of the burden of disease as well. The last point I will make is when people test at home, if they test positive, the first thought every single American should have is, am I eligible for treatment? The truth is, we have fantastic treatments. Anybody over the age of 50, anybody with chronic disease should get evaluated. Personally, as a physician, I think it's very clear to me that anybody in their 60s or above should be treated. Like, there should be a good reason not to treat somebody. And they're rarely a good reason, meaning most people should be getting treated right now. Um, and I, that is a message we've been delivering to doctors and nurses. That's a message we've been delivering to the American people. If you get a positive test at home, stay away from others so you don't infect them, and get evaluated to get treated. Ken, on the funding that was that is being used to purchase the new tests for this new round for people to uh, get them sent to their houses, were there cuts to other COVID programs in order to pay for those tests? Yeah, yeah so let me talk about um, how we're able to do this. So we paused the program, you know, at the end of the summer because we wanted to make sure that we still had supply for a winter potential increase of cases in, in the winter. Um, Second is while we, as I have mentioned from here before, while we took a lot of the resources we had for tests to purchase vaccines um, and treatments, we still had some resources left. We didn't use deplete the whole supply. And so we had money in the American Rescue Plan uh, to still be able to buy some more tests. That combination has allowed us to do this. It is on a limited basis. We're not going to be able to keep this open forever. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Hey, JP, thank you very Appreciate much. It. And thanks, everybody. All right. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Okay. Just a couple of things at the top, and then we'll take some questions. So today is the final day of the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit, a summit that has underscored the U.S. commitment to reinvigorating partnerships across the continent. President Biden, Vice President Harris, and other officials across the administration have had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with the leaders from across Africa over the last couple of days, including at last night's dinner here at the White House. Now, this afternoon, the President will address the summit one more time at this afternoon's discussion on food security and food system resilience. This week, President Biden and Vice President Harris have had the opportunity to announce new initiatives that will empower African institutions and citizens. The President reaffirmed our resolve to work collaboratively with African governments, businesses, and civil, civil society to strengthen people-to-people -people ties, ensure more inclusive and res responsive global institutions, build a strong and sustainable <laughs> global economy, foster new technology and innovative strengthen uh, innovation, strengthen health systems, and prepare for the next pandemic, tackle the food security and climate crisis, support democracy and human rights, and advance peace and security. The Biden-Harris administration plans to commit at least $55 billion in Africa over the next three years, working closely with Congress, and more than $15 billion in private sector investment deals were announced at the U.S.-Africa Business Forum. And of course, you've heard the, the President announce this week's plan, this, this week plans, this week, well, this week to plan to travel to Africa and to continue the work over the course of, of this summit and to strengthen our partnership across the continent. I also want to talk about something uh, that affects millions of, um, of people across the country every day. And uh, with the holiday season upon us and in the light of the tra tragic news about Twitch this week, we think it's important that we shed light on the resources available to any American dealing with mental health challenges or emotional distress. Tomorrow, 
said the second gentleman, uh, second gentleman Douglas Emhoff, and leaders from Department of Health and Human Services will visit a local 988 call center and meet with crisis counselors who are providing mental health and suicide prevention support to people from all backgrounds and walks of life. The 988 Suicide and Prevention Lifeline provides free, confidential, 24-7 support to Americans across the country experiencing suicidal crisis or severe emotional distress. Anyone anywhere in the country can call or text 988 or chat 988lifeline.org to reach a live trained counselor. And thanks to the president, our administration has invested $432 million in getting the 988 suicide and crisis lifeline up and running in communities across the country, an 18-fold increase in investment from the previous uh, administration. So before we go into questions, uh, I'll repeat myself one last time here for all of you, all of those who are struggling, we stand with you and our administration will keep fighting for you. One last thing before we, well, last thing we really take question is I want to take a, uh, give you guys a little bit of the week ahead. Uh, just a quick look here. This evening, the president will travel to Wilmington, Delaware. Tomorrow, the president will visit and speak at a town hall at the, at the Major Joseph R. Bo Biden III National Guard Reserve Center in Newcastle, Delaware. This is a capstone on the Department of Vet Veterans Affairs Pact Act Week of Action with over 90 events and counting held across the country to encourage veterans to sign up for health care, get screened for toxic exposure, and submit a claim if they are experiencing a toxic exposure related condition. The president will speak with veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors to discuss the historic expansion of benefits and services resulting from the Bipartisan PACT Act. Uh, I anticipate a preview with more details it will be shared ahead of the event, so please stay tuned to that. Afterwards, the president will return to Washington, D.C. for internal meetings and uh, more holiday receptions. Friday evening, the president will return to Wilmington, Delaware, where he will remain over the weekend. On Monday, the president will return to Washington, D.C., and in the evening, he and the First Lady will host a Hanukkah holiday reception at, in the Grand Foyer, right here in the White House, in the residence, to be more precise. We'll have more to share on next week's guidance in the coming days, but we can also confirm today that next weekend, the president and First Lady will celebrate Christmas at the White House. And with that, Zeke, you want to kick us off? Thanks, Brian. Uh, just a bit housekeeping to start off with. I was hoping you could shed some light on the apparent radio miscommunication that kept the White House press pool, separate press pool from the President's motorcade when it occurred for the White House today. Yes. Give me one second because I do have something to share on that. Um, so there was no er emergency, just to be clear, or a security situation. And it appears that there was a radio miscommunication upon, uh, upon departure. Uh, Vance picked up the White House staff and press that were left at the convention center. So also White House staff were also left uh, as well. And we waited to, to start the press briefing until uh, everyone returned to the White House. We share an appreciation for how important it is for the press pool to travel with the president. And this remains a priority for our entire team. We sincerely apologize uh, for the confusion and inconvenience. And just just to reiterate, we also sadly left uh, White House staff as well at the convention center. So this was, this was a, uh, it was not uh, just uh, the press. So just wanted to make that clear again. But with all seriousness, we do apologize uh, for that. Um, the president, in his remarks earlier, alluded to a trip to uh, to Africa uh, himself. Give details on when he might go and where he might go. And I know that Jake spoke to this when he was here on on Monday as well. Look, I don't have anything to to share at this time. Uh, what I can say is, and this is basically what the, Jake said uh, on Monday, is that uh, the vice president and a number of cabinet officials, uh, they're all looking forward uh, to visiting uh, the African continent in 2023. Just don't have anything uh, to preview at this time. And then, uh, I'm sorry, and back on, on COVID, uh, this is a bit, Dr. Jha talked a lot about the importance of Americans getting vaccinated. The latest CDC data shows that you know, only about 14 percent of Americans have actually gotten the updated vaccines. Does the president believe that he or his administration bears some responsibility for not being able to convince the vast majority of Americans to get these updated shots that uh, we heard from Dr. John are so important? In this well, system? let's not forget, Zeke, when, when the president walked into the administration, he put forth a comprehensive uh, COVID vaccination 
uh, plan uh, that that what that did not exist before he stepped into the um, into the administration that helped get more than 200 million Americans across the country fully vaccinated uh, and also made sure that there was equity at the center uh, of his plan look we're in a different phase as we you've heard us say uh, in this pandemic and uh, and we are going to encourage people to get that new vaccine we have the tools we have the tools that we know work uh, when it comes to COVID, when it comes to this pandemic, and uh, and we're going to continue to let folks know to utilize those tools. And so you've seen, I, as I started this uh, briefing saying we're seeing a familiar face uh, in the press briefing room, and that's because we've been trying to be very consistent on pushing that message out and letting people know that they need to get the new vaccine. It is important. We know it works, especially as they're going to see their grandparents, as they're going to see families, how important it is to get that new vaccine for themselves, but also for their loved ones. Look, we believe we've had a, a comprehensive message. We've had a comprehensive plan. Uh, but again, we're in a new phase of this uh, of this pandemic, and we just have to continue uh, to beat the drum, and we'll continue to do that. Thanks, Green. On immigration, we've talked to so many Border Patrol agents and leaders who are just really worried and anxious about the possibility of Title 42 ending next week. Big picture, what is the administration doing right now to get ready for that? So a couple of things that I want to lay out, and I kind of laid this out before, but um I want to re reiterate it here is that um, uh, you know we're doing the work we're going to do this in a safe and hu humane way and we'll, we will have more uh, to share on the proposed preparedness next week before the December uh, 21st uh, date but uh, look we also need Congress to act it is important uh, that they deliver the resources we requested for the border security and management uh, they need to pass the comprehensive immigration reform uh, that we have put forth on day one the president put forth a comprehensive uh, reform plan that dealt with protecting uh, for dream, protecting for dreamers, cutting down uh, the asylum uh, the asylum uh, buildup that we have been seeing, uh, especially because of what what the last administration did, and they completely gutted the system. And we know that uh, this has been a, a multi decade long problem. We need to modernize the system, and this is something that the president has put forth. And we are looking for uh, Congress to act. We are asking Congress to act, and so uh, but. In the meantime, what we have been able to do is the president, as I've mentioned before, has secured uh, historic funding. We have 23,000 uh, border security agents at the border, and that is the most amount that we've ever had. And that's because of what the president has been able to do. Uh, and we have worked to uh, you know, launch a historic anti-smuggling operations that are uh, taking thousands of smugglers off the streets. Uh, but look, the reality is we need Congress to take action. We need to do this in a bipartisan way, uh, as we have done, as the president has been able uh, to do more than 200 times during his administration. There's been some reporting out there that the administration is considering changes to the asylum policy, potentially making it so that only someone can, someone can only apply for asylum if they've already been denied from another country like Mexico. Is that true? Is the administration considering any changes to policy? So look, I know there's a lot of rumors out there about that, a lot of speculation. I don't have anything to announce at this time or from here at this time. Uh, what I would encourage people to do is to read uh, the Department of Homeland Security. They put out, they put forth a six-point uh, plan uh, on how they're going to move forward with dealing uh, with dealing uh, when uh, with dealing with the post December 21st uh, deadline when uh, Title 42 indeed lifts. Uh, but don't have anything more to announce about a any uh, any new plans from here okay that's great um dhs warned in a memo uh, obtained by cnn this week that the end of title 42 will quote likely increase migration flows immediately into the u.s so i'm wondering how many migrants are you expecting to try and cross into the u.s through the southern border next week and um and, and is the administration prepared uh, for this anticipated surge so look you know we have all, we have an intensive all of government effort uh, underway to prepare. Uh, as I was stating earlier, uh, when I was being asked a question by Mary, uh, we'll have more to share uh, uh, ahead of the, 20, the December 21st deadline. But in the meantime, uh, DHS is surging resources to the border. Uh, as you've seen, uh, as you're probably seeing it in El Paso, I talked a little bit about this on, on Monday, where, where over the last 72 hours, they've moved thousands of individuals out of, uh, out, out of the city. They're doubling down on the anti-smuggling operations that the president launched month, month ago. 
Uh, they're also working with our international partners to discourage disorderly mass movements across the border. Moving forward, expect us to continue leaning in on our successful uh, strategies like these and like our parole program for Venezuela nationals, which has drastically reduced the number of Venezuelans attempting to enter unlawfully and will continue to drive messaging in the region to counter disinformation from smugglers. So that's another thing uh, that we, you know, we have to keep an eye on is how the misinformation that's going to be going out to smugglers uh, in the next couple of days and so we have to make sure we'll work together with all of you our team will to make sure that that doesn't happen because uh, that is one of the big issues that we're seeing when it comes to uh, migrants uh, trying to cross are, the border. Are you aware of this warning from DHS and do you have an estimate of how many people you're expecting will try and cross the border when Title 42? Look I don't have an estimate to share with you what I can tell you is that the uh, Department of Homeland, uh, Homeland Security has put out uh, a six-point plan as you all know my uh, Secretary Mayorkas was at the border uh, just recently to talk about this plan, put out a statement. And so we are focused. Uh, we are focused and we are prepared. Uh, we will have more to share in the uh, next coming days uh, on, this, uh, on this piece. Uh, but again, uh, we, have, uh, we have done the work from this administration by securing record, uh, record funding, and we are asking Congress for Congress to act. Uh, we, are not, we are not asking for political stunts. We're, we continue to see political stunts from uh, many Republicans out there, and that's not how we're going to fix uh, this issue. They want to, uh, they want to uh, secure the border. We've been doing that work on our own. And uh, we ask, we're asking them to, hey, you know what? There's an immigration reform plan that the president put out on the first day. They should work with us and do this in a bipartisan way. And then in terms of the funding negotiations on Capitol Hill, we've seen this administration, this president, at times play a more hands-on role, a more hands-off role in some negotiations, depending on the situation. What's the case with these negotiations? How involved has the president which, been? Which particular negotiations are you, ta are you talking about? The spending bill. The spending, oh, the spending, the omnibus bill yes. more broadly. Uh, so, look, we're encouraged by the bipartisanship that we're currently seeing uh, to, to uh, the progress that we're seeing in Congress uh, from leaders and, and the progress that they're making. So it's a key step on the path to a full year government funding bill that delivers for the American people. We're optimistic. Uh, that members of both parties can build on this progress and produce a funding bill that can pass uh, the House and Senate signed into law by, by the President. Uh, but to your question, though, look, uh, the President has been very engaged. Uh, he's been talking to congressional members. He had the big four here not too long ago, and this was uh, in the readout. This was uh, the government funding was uh, the main priority that they discussed. Uh, and we have our team here. We have uh, Shalanda Young from OMB. I've mentioned this before, who's the director, who has been playing point on this, who knows how to work across the, lo across, the, across the aisle and do things in a bipartisan way, and she uh, is leading that effort along with our uh, Office of Ledge Affairs, who have had multiple calls, multiple meetings in getting this done. Look, this was done in a bipartisan way last year, uh, and we believe it can be done in a bipartisan way this year are as well. Are you confident this one-week stopgap will pass we are, in we, time? We, we, I mean, we have said, I said this earlier, uh, you know, if Congress needs a little bit more time to get this done, uh, we're, they should take that time, but we believe there's enough time to get the omnibus, omnibus done. Uh, and so we are we are encouraged by what we're seeing in, in that progress, and we believe that it can get done in time. Thanks, Green. The President mentioned in his statement yesterday about the Sandy Hook uh, killings, the anniversary, um, again, his push for an assault weapons ban, and also talked about um, moral guilt uh, in not having done more in the last 10 years. There's only a couple weeks left for the lame duck. Can you give us an update on just what the next steps are that he sees uh, for this White House, for this administration, in getting that assault weapons ban passed? So look, we have been in close touch with Senate leadership on this. As you as you just mentioned, this is a priority for this president. It has been for some time. Uh, he was a leader on this uh, during his Senate days uh, and also as vice president. And so he's going to continue to push for this. Uh, whether this happens in the next couple of weeks or it happens in the next several months, he is going to uh, really work hard uh, to get this done. And. Um, you know, he's he's talked about it at almost en every moment that he can, every time that he had an opportunity to talk about uh, the the shootings that we have seen, uh, how it's destroyed our communities, how it's destroyed families. Uh, he's going to continue to lift that up uh, to the American people. Uh, again, we're going to have those conversations with Senate leadership. We have been the last couple of days. Uh, don't have a timeline for you. This is indeed a, a priority for this president and his administration. Uh, we have seen the work that he's done this first uh, year and a half. He did the most, uh, did the most executive actions. Uh, 
uh, on gun violence than any other president. And so clearly, uh, this is a priority for this president. Beyond um, him speaking about it is, it, is it really that? Is the strategy basically to use the bully pulpit? Or I mean, are there other steps? That's an important strategy. I mean, right, the president has one of the most powerful bully pulpits uh, in the country, in the world, even, right? And so uh, we have seen him use it in an effective way to get historic, piece, historic pieces of legislation done. Uh, and so he's going to continue to do that. But we're also having conversations with Senate leadership. That will not stop or end uh, when it comes to this issue. Okay. Uh, thanks, Corrine. Um, just before you came out, the president had authorized the release of documents related to John F. Kennedy's assassination. Um, and since you've been at the podium, the National Archives has started posting those documents. Can you talk about that decision to, to release those and also address um, Seventy percent of the documents are being released. Thirty percent still are not. What is taking so long in the other thirty percent? Given it's been fifty years. So look, as you know, this was has been a commitment of this president, right? Uh, the president, the president's actions have led to public release of over fourteen thousand uh, records, including approximately twelve thousand today. Just to give everyone specifics here, as a result, we're talking about ninety-seven percent of the co of the collection is now available to the public. Uh, this reflects, again, the president's commitment uh, to making these records available to the public to the greatest extent possible, consistent with national security. So this is a commitment that the president has been making uh, for some time or made some time ago. Uh, president Biden believes all information related to President Kennedy's assassination should be released to the greatest extent possible, consistent with, again, national security. That's why he directed the acting archivist to conduct a supplementary six-month review of a of a subset of the remaining redacted records to ensure they are disclosed to the greatest extent possible. He also directed all remaining redacted information to be disclosed to the public when uh, the basis for the continued restriction of that information no longer outweighs uh, the public interest. So obviously there's a national security component here, uh, but he is committed to getting that information out. And right now we're seeing more than 97% uh, of the collection that's out there for, for folks to, to review. Thank you, Karine. Uh, I have two questions for you. Congressman Cohen and Wilson from the Helsinki Commission introduced a resolution urging President Biden to take steps to suspend or terminate uh, Russia's rights and privileges at the UN Security Council. Does the president support this effort? What steps he can take? Is this goal achievable? Yes, uh, we do support. Um, uh, we do support that effort. Um, can you say the question one more time? I just want to make sure. Uh, the, the, the resolution uh, make sure says that right. the president asks the president, urges the president to take steps to suspend or terminate Russia's rights uh, in the US, UN Security oh, Council. Oh, UN Security Council. Got it. So um, look, Russia's conduct in, uh, in Ukraine is, is, is a violation of the UN. A charter and is an affront to the core mandate of the Security Council, and we see it as an outrageous. It is outrageous for a permanent member uh, of the UN Security Council to be violating uh, the charter and waging such a brutal war on Ukraine, including by trying to inflict such widespread human suffering and targeting critical infrastructure. So, we successfully led uh, a vote in the UN General Assembly to suspend uh, Russia from the U UN hum hum Human Rights Council, and we have worked to prevent uh, Russia from taking leadership positions elsewhere in the UN system. So uh, we've been very consistent on this. If there were a path to suspend Russia from the UN Security Council, we would pursue it immediately. Uh, unfortunately, we don't see uh, the UN, uh, we don't see um, uh, the UN rules changing. And so we are focused on continuing to take actions to isolate Russia, uh, including in international organizations and hold Russia accountable, including uh, through sanctions and enforcement actions we announced uh, today, as you saw. I have a follow-up on uh, Patriots for Ukraine also. Uh, since, there, since there was no announcement on this yet, I would like to ask if uh, the President is even considering sending uh, Patriots uh, to Ukraine, and uh, what's the White House's response to warnings coming from the Kremlin uh, about possible consequences if the U.S. sends patriots to Ukraine. So first, let me take your last question first. Uh, look, the only the only uh, provocative uh, moves are being made by Russia, and Russia is the aggressor. 
aggressor here, and, and let's not, we should never forget that. We should never forget who is actually, who actually started uh, this war, and it was Russia. So that's, that's point one. Point two, the United States is not now, nor has it been at war with Russia. This is responding to uh, what we've heard from Russia this past 24 hours. Uh, we, we've been doing exactly what President Biden told President Putin we would do one year ago if Russia attacked Ukraine, providing security assistance to help uh, Ukraine defend itself. That's what you have been seeing uh, from this administration, from this White House. Uh, finally, while I don't have any new security assistance packages to speak of today, as you all know, uh, President Biden has been clear about this. The United States will continue to support Ukraine for as long as it takes alongside our allies and partners as the people of Ukraine defend their country, as they defend uh, their freedom, as they defend uh, their sovereignty, and we will continue to do that. But any announcement this week, as it was reported by the U.S. I, media? I just don't have anything to share with you at this time. Go ahead, JJ. Um, I'm wondering if the White House has any reaction on two bills that moved through the U.S. Senate. One is on TikTok. The Senate voted to ban TikTok from all government-issued phones. Let's start with that one. Does the White House have feelings on that bill? So, um, as I've uh, as I've said before, uh, you know, um, want to be very careful on uh, commenting on any uh, specific legislation at this time. So, we'd refer you to Congress on the next steps. We don't get involved in the process uh, as we've done in the past. But look. Just more broadly, uh, there are a range of tech app applications and products that are not allowed to be used uh, on, the White, on the White House and other federal government work equipment for security reasons, including uh, TikTok. We will not go into any further details uh, about security policies that we have here, uh, but I'm not going to get into the process. Uh, I know that this just happened, so we're going to let Congress uh, move forward with their process on that one. What yeah. about the Senate bill that would essentially halt um, <coughs> Huawei's access to U.S. banks? The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is one of the sponsors of that bill. Does the White House have a position on that one? No, don't have a position on that one at this time from here. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, Americans clearly divided about immigration. Um, from the White House perspective, though, should Americans be supportive or concerned with the end of Title 42? which obviously stops most migrants from being able to apply for asylum. What Americans should know is that the president uh, has done uh, has done the work uh, to deal with what we're seeing at the border since day one. What Americans should know is that the president put forth an immigration reform policy uh, to make sure that we're dealing with a broken system, uh, to make sure that we're able to protect dreamers, to make sure that we deal with the backlog that we're seeing uh, with asylum uh, seekers, uh, to fix the gutted system that was uh, that has been around for some time, but certainly uh, was uh, gutted by the last administration, and the work that the president has done, he wants to do this in a bipartisan way. But what we're seeing is Republicans continue uh, to move forward with political stunts. Many of them are doing this, uh, and we continue to see this for over the last several months. So the president has done the work. He secured record funding. Again, I mentioned 23,000 agents uh, that are at the border who are working night and day to protect and secure the border, and that's because of the work that this president uh, has done. And we're working on anti-smuggling efforts as well. And so, look, uh, what, the, what the American people should know is that we have taken the steps, we're taking the step to prepare for what is, uh, for, uh, for when uh, Title 42 is lifted uh, next week. Uh, and you saw that from the Department of Homeland Security. S Secretary Mayorkas was very clear about that. He laid out their six-point plan when he was uh, at the border just a couple of days ago. And this is an administration that has taken this very, very seriously. But does the White House think that ending Title 42, a Trump era policy, is a good thing? What I'm telling you is that it was a court order uh, that was, uh, that we are following. Uh, and uh, we're going to follow the law when it comes to uh, from what, what the court has decided to do. What I can tell you is what the president has done over the last two years uh, to make sure that we're dealing with border security. We hear it from many Republicans, right? You guys report on it. Many Republicans say over and over and over again that we need to do work at the border, that we need to secure the border. But yet they refuse to work with us on this piece of legislation. Instead, what they choose to do is uh, do political stunts. That doesn't help. Can I ask one question about Afghanistan? Um, there are negotiations about including the Afghan Af Adjustment Act in the spending bill. There's been a group of retired ambassadors who have been pushing for its inclusion. The Biden administration has tried to get this in the spending bill before, unsuccessfully. 
what is the administration doing differently this time to get to so, try to do that? As you know, uh, by your statement, we strongly support uh, the ongoing congressional efforts to pass uh, the Afghan Adjustment Act, and we urge Congress, we're going to continue to do this, to send the legislation to the President uh, to provide a path to, perm to permanent legal status for Afghans. And we have joined our communities and resettled uh, across, uh, uh, who have joined our communities and re resettled across our country through Operation Allies Welcome. So that is something that we're going to continue to ask for Congress to act. Uh, we first asked Congress to pass this legislation back in August of 2021 and have been working with members of uh, Congress from both parties to try to pass it ever since. And we know that there is a bipartisan support for this bill and, and that negotiations in the Senate are ongoing. It's important to take care of our Afghan allies who took uh, care of us uh, during the 20 years of this, uh, uh, of the U.S., uh, of the years that U.S. was, uh, was at war in Afghanistan. So we take this very seriously. We strongly support it. We're going to continue to have conversations with members of Congress and continue to urge them to get this done. I mean, to gather a few minutes from the president's presentations. You take one or two more. I'll take one or two more. I'll take one, one from the back that I haven't taken one. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Green. Uh, Jake Sullivan was in here on Monday and said an engagement with Russian counterparts was planned for this week on the hallway on case. Do you have any updates on that or can you say whether that happened? So, uh, as you know, we want to be really mindful of uh, of any conversations that we have as we're talking about negotiations, so we're not going to, uh, 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 you know, speak about that in public. I don't have anything to share. Uh, but so that you know, and I, we've said this before, and Jake has been very clear, the President has been very clear, we take uh, this, uh, when Americans are wrongfully detained or held hostage, we take that very seriously. Uh, and we are going to do everything that we can to bring Paul Whelan home. Uh, that is a, a priority. Uh, but certainly we're not going to talk about steps or any conversations in public because uh, we want to make sure that we get this done. And just one other question. Um, can you give us an update on Mayor Garcetti's nomination as Ambassador to India? Does the President need to resubmit his name to the new Congress? Where are you guys at with that? So, look, as you know, this is a priority and continues to be a priority for us. Uh, Mayor Garcetti is well qualified uh, to serve in this vital role. Uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, as you know, uh, voted Mayor Garcetti out of committee unanimously after reviewing uh, this matter thoroughly. And we're hopefully and we're hopeful uh, that full Senate will confirm him uh, uh, promptly. And so we're going to continue to support him. Okay. Go ahead, Emily. Thanks, Greg. I have to follow up on Title 42. I know you said you guys are hopeful that the omnibus gets passed, but what kind of preparations are being done in case it doesn't and communities do get overwhelmed and need some resources? And also, does the administration fear that the end of Title 42 will lead to a spike in COVID cases in the country? So let me just talk a little bit about the three. There's three billion dollars uh, for border funding. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, you know, again, if Republicans are serious about this, uh, we put forth some uh, three billion dollar plan uh, that we are asking for Congress uh, to support. Uh, here's what it would do: it would ensure that the men and women of the Department of Homeland Security have the resources they need to secure our border and build a safe, orderly, and humane immigration system. Uh, the funding will integrate surveillance uh, uh, towers, inspect technology. Technology, border Patrol rotor, rotary wing aircraft and helicopter, aircraft sensor upgrades, tactical marine time uh, surveillance system, and also law enforcement radios, faster asylum claim processing, and so much more. So we believe it's incredibly important to get that done as well. Uh, but to your question uh, about the the, uh, the winter surge, how we're how Dr. Ja was talking about this from from the podium. Look, because of the president's uh, president's work and what he's been able to do uh, throughout his administration, the American people have tools. We know what works, and to protect to protect themselves from COVID, and we continue to encourage them to use the tools as we always have. Uh, now, on Title 42, we've inquired, we, we are required by the court uh, to lift Title 42, and we plan to comply with that order. And so, uh, but Title 42 or not, every individual encountered at the border is screened and processed by Border Patrol agents before they are placed in removal proceedings. And like I've said a couple times already, you know, Department of Health, Homeland Security uh, has, been on, has been on top of this. We are prepared. We are ready to do this in a humane way uh, and in a safe way. And so it is something that the president has been working on since day one of his administration. That's great. All right. Thanks, great. everybody. Thanks, everybody. Do you have time All for right. one more screen? Got to go. Thanks, everybody.